When we bought the Richard Hamilton, in part it was because of the story that you explained to me. I wasn't that familiar with him. I dug into it after the fact. So there are moments in time where you look at a piece and you say, listen, I love the aesthetic, but I also love the story behind it on a financial basis and you buy. That one I would say was a combination. Right, welcome back to my podcast. I'm live here in New York City. I'm at a fabulous hotel, the Gansevoort. First time staying here, absolutely amazing hotel. And I'm next to the man, the hotelier, the businessman, Michael. You've been someone that I've admired. I've been quite inspired by over the years. Uh, even though I've not really said that to you too many times directly, I, I really you can am. say it to me daily if you feel free. <laughs> um, I consider myself a business person, but I'm, I'm a mere pup, you know, I'm still learning the craft and I want to become a super, super successful person. Hence why I'm over here, you know, pounding the streets, looking at Hamilton stuff and trying to connect with a, a wider demographic. And um, when I was reading up on you, because I read one of your articles, uh, interview from Forbes in 2018. Yeah. Um, it said there since 1999 that you've been co-developed about a billion dollars worth of property. Yeah. And between me and Joe, who you met before, my business partner, we started a property company and we're trying to grow that. So I'm very, very intrigued about property. I'm very, very intrigued about entrepreneurship and also business in, in general. So where do I begin? I mean, how, how, like when you hear that sort of number, $1 billion worth of real estate and property, I mean, does, do, do you sometimes pinch yourself or you don't really think about the numbers? Well, I wish I still owned the billion dollars worth of properties. Um, you know, numbers have gotten so large and um, it, it, it amazes me sometimes. You know, when, when I've gotten loans a couple of times, I've, you know, my, I'm partners with my father, lucky enough to have that relationship. And- I met uh, your father, really yeah, nice guy. Yeah, thank you. And, um, and you get these loans on some of these deals and you realize the size and the responsibility that comes with it. And it's always a bit shocking uh, because deal size, for example, you know, the, the construction of this property in 2002, uh, the purchase of that construction contract was 34 million. To build this hotel today would cost, just in hard costs alone, probably 100, 110 million dollars. So the size of deals in comparison to when I first started in the industry has dramatically changed to do the same deal. You know, so, so when you look at valuation or you look at at deal size, it, it, the amount of effort that might go into my doing a hotel of this size uh, in comparison to my doing a hotel in Miami, which was seven times the square footage of this project, it's not really a dramatic difference. It's just more, are you able to raise the capital and who those partners and sources are? It's a bit of a skewed thing to think in terms of dollar size, and it's more important to think in terms of the kinds of deals, the kinds of um, properties that you work on, because the effort that goes into it is relative you know it's really relative and and it really comes down to the ability to, to acquire capital uh, whether it be your own or third party whether it be equity or debt uh, to make the deals happen me and joe uh, we're doing our biggest project to date and it's very very small in comparison to something like this we bought a solicitor's building right and converting it into five flats already got planning permission on it but the next one we're looking at is 14 flats and right. for us but it's the same amount of work yeah i promise you it's going to be the exact it, same amount of work if not like now you've learned a lot of the lessons it'll probably be a smoother uh project for you than doing the five unit one because the, the complications are generally the same it's just when you start talking about the dollar sizes that it are, are pound uh, that it, it becomes scarier, but the reality is is the the lessons that you learn <laughs> from a, a small deal is a great way to start in the business because it will get you into the position that you now know okay approaching the bigger deal this is how I have to approach it and and rather learn you know what is uh, something your teeth uh, you know like cut your teeth cut, you, cut your teeth thank you I'm horrible with things uh, cut your teeth on a smaller deal. Uh, because this way, the next time when you do it, you'll, on a larger deal, you have less risks. So fortunately, what I was going to say is that we, we it, you know, it's relatively small amount of capital, so we bought it in cash, and then we're going to refinance it by going probably to a high street lender, someone right. like that. Um, but with something like this, you know, a hotel, it bang in the meatpacking district, you know, right. prime location. I mean, I, I can't imagine you can just rock up to a. Uh, high street lender and ask him for, I don't know, half, I don't know, a hundred million dollars, for example. No, so who I mean, would you go to? Generally, one, there's a, there are brokers that specialize in, in acquiring that kind of capital. 
Um, you know, in deals, when you get into this size, a lot of the times it's your equity, then there's a, a first mortgage and there's a mezzanine lender between you and, and the, the first mortgage lender. So it really depends on how much capital you have readily available for your end of the deal. Um, but generally, it's very institutional. Uh, the kinds of players that you're dealing with, particularly on the debt side, are larger banks, uh, some funds, some hedge funds, some pension funds, but you're really dealing with more institutional kind of cash that have very sp specific parameters of the kinds of loans that they're willing to do. Um, when you get into construction loans, it's even a narrower group of uh, possibilities. Uh, a lot of firms do not want to take construction risk. So you start really getting down to a very narrow group of very specific, very institutional kind of lenders uh, that will put the money into a deal that is a construction loan. So. It's, you know, you usually have to go to a specialist to help find those. I, I, I'm lucky enough to have come out of being a lender um, myself at a bank or two. And when I was in the industry, I made a lot of great contacts. So a lot of the loans we've gotten have been through relationships. But at the same time, many of our loans have also come through brokers. You said something earlier to me about you going for lunch or dinner with a friend and uh, the boyfriend or husband, he's got a company, he's got 40,000 people yes. working for him. Is right. that correct? Yes. And the reason why I picked up on that is because I've interviewed a lot of entrepreneurs, especially people in the, in the property side of stuff. And what I notice, very successful individuals, they typically talk about the amount of maybe assets or the amount of employees that these companies have got, rather than, which I, I would probably normally say, which is about their net worth or something. It's a good psychology to have because- yeah, I'm more it, focused on, on the, for me, Operation. Yeah, the operation is impressive to me to be able to operate a firm with that many tentacles all over the world, with that many offices, and to still maintain a level of control. Um, you know, just in one hotel where you have five or six different food and beverage venues, you have the hotel operation, you have many departments in the hotel operation. It's hard to get the level of service and reactivity that you want from your staff on any given day. So imagine doing it when you have 40,000 employees instead of let's say 200. And um, so to me, it's incredibly impressive to have built an organization like this gentleman has supposedly, um, of 40,000 employees around the world and to be able to feel that you're getting what you need to out of your teams in any office around the, around the world. Because it's the systems, it's the foundation, it's, it's, it's the culture, yeah, it's everything. It's to be able to build that organization and to actually have it function is an amazing talent. So. Well, um, I'm going to ask you quite a uh, point blank question. Sure. Do you consider yourself a success? I think it's all relative, isn't it? You know, um, I get to do a job that I like. I get to meet interesting people. You know, I get to do things like this, which is always fun. Um, so I, I was talking to a successful um, magazine and digital marketing person today. Um, and I said, I, there aren't really many jobs I would rather have. I wish it was a bit of an easier ride the last few years in my industry. You know, being in hospitality has really been very, very difficult, um, especially in a major urban center like New York. Um, but at the same time, I love the creative side of what I get to do. I love to create the product. I like putting the pieces together. It's a puzzle. So for me, that's always, um, you know, a joy. Um, obviously, there's always difficulties that come along with it. Um, and I sort of look at it like the economic side of it, the financial side of it will come together as long as I do my job well and people have a great experience. So that's what my focus is really. Part of the reason why I asked that is because I'm quite observant when I see you. Um, I was eating lunch earlier and I know you was in the business meeting. I don't, know if you, don't even know if you noticed I was there, but you always seem to be focused and onto the next thing. And I always think to myself, does, does Michael ever switch off? Does he actually enjoy the moment or is that just you being an entrepreneur? Well, my girlfriend would tell you I don't enjoy the moment. <laughs> so it's very difficult um, when you're in your own venue to enjoy the moment. I, I try not to do most of my socializing in my own venues other than relatively for business purposes. Um, if you're, I believe that if you're in hospitality and you're good at what you do, it's very hard to enjoy your, the, your own facilities because the reality is, is I, don't, I never see the things that are right. I only see the things that are wrong, you know? So that's not the greatest way to live your life and that's why I, when I turn things off I go to other people that I you know other people's venues that I think are really fun or, or different and I have no responsibility anymore but when I'm here I'm bouncing between a meeting or bouncing between picking up lint off the floor or 
or just getting the windows right or you know when we came up here we're in a rooftop space and some of the windows were open and it's winter so it's cold in here right now it's warming up um, you know I was a little frustrated that my staff hadn't closed the windows so um, it makes it very difficult for me to find peace in my own venues but that's I hopefully what makes me good at what I do and I see the same trait in a lot of the people I do business with is it fair to say then in the most best respects ever that you see yourself as a bit of a perfectionist uh, certainly in terms of my work you know I, I'm a little bit more flexible in my own home I don't need things to be as picture perfect but when I'm on property I expect my team to have the same concerns and the same drive to, to get the clients experience perfect and the only way to do that is detail we're in the detail business we're in the memories the experience business and in order to do that the right way you have to be diligent about like the details because if you let it go it just gets worse and worse and worse there is no coming back from it once you let the a property decline or you let the guest experience suffer uh, so guest recovery is a very difficult art and it's a lot easier to have someone be happy from the get-go than it is to start with a negative and have to fix their experience after the fact most people never forgive you so I got introduced to you uh, when we was in London at the Curtin Hotel right. that was the, your other um, hotel that you had on Curtin Road in Shoreditch right. which I thought was a fabulous hotel I mean Thank just you. for the audience we we done a few projects down there for the Richard Hamilton market we done yeah. a private screening of the Shadow Man and I really had some really fantastic nights down there. In actual fact, I watched a few of the big boxing matches in the cinema room. And that, that place ran like clockwork. I mean, it was exceptional. I stayed there once. I trained in there a bunch of times and I had some really good nights out there. When we talk about business people, successful people, we do naturally talk about all the successes, but then what about the challenges or the hardships? Obviously the curtain, unfortunately, uh, didn't survive COVID. So tell us a little bit more about that. You know, um, I, sat there looking at my options you know when the world fell apart we had done a sale lease back to a very successful family out of uh, the UK uh, so we no longer owned the property we had owned the fee interest originally developed the property built it sold it to a family um, and we had a, taken back a lease so we were a leaseholder at that point and looking at my options concerning whether I should continue down the road with that project and New York which was in the middle of a uh, renovation and taking massive losses because of the lack of there was just no clients in New York City uh, you couldn't travel to New York at, at all um, we made the decision that it was better to work out an exit with the, the landowners and they had every right to expect to not have to amend their lease if they didn't want to and they felt that they could do better on the open market in the long run and so we cut a equitable exit with them those are tough choices you know it was uh, seven, eight years of my life put into that project. Um, I had built a business model that was working. Um, but at the same time, you know, um, you're in an industry and you're an entrepreneur. You have to sometimes realize it's a sunk cost. Um, and sometimes, you know, when you have a sunk cost, you have to walk away. And so we made the decision that it wasn't in our best interest to continue down the path with multiple projects at that moment. We had to focus our energies here, which is the project that my reputation was built on. So, um, you know, my reputation is the guy who did Gans of Ort. So people were starting to know me in Europe as the guy who did the curtain. But given the choice, I knew that, that for me to continue, I could not afford to risk this project. What was the biggest learning um, takeaway or experience that you took from that? The um, reason why I ask is because, number one, I'm intrigued. But right. Hopefully, a young entrepreneur is going to be watching this, and uh, they can they can get a bit of wisdom from from that experience. Um, it's very difficult to build in a foreign market. We had hired a contractor uh, that had a good reputation. They did a terrible job, made it very difficult to get the operation going right because we had so many issues with a new build, which you should not have. Um, and I, you know, it's hard because COVID is such a unique. Um, situation that to use that as an example of a risk factor it's a hard it's hard to say that that's something I ever would have considered as a real risk factor it had never happened in the history of the world since 1918 and the Spanish flu yeah, yeah and so there had never been a shutdown of the United States there had never been a shutdown of, of international commerce between the countries so I'm not really sure what the lesson I can say specifically learned other than Sometimes you have to make choices to retrench and you try to rebuild your business from there and, and it's better to survive and make it to the next day than it is to you know, push all your chips in and, and, and run the risk of, of basically going belly up. And that wasn't for us an option. So we made the decision, the, what was seemed 
the rational decision, which was to retrench and then push forward from there. And um, you know, we're very lucky. You know, the the reception we're getting for the renovation that we've done in New York. I mean, we we renovated from bottom all the way to the top, and uh, I know you're experiencing it. Um, you know, we did a heavy influence of, of um, technology throughout the building. Uh, we really touched every single area of the property, added a bunch of new food and beverage venues. So we took this as an opportunity to rebuild our business here and to change people's perception that this hotel used to be perceived as a very high-end but party-esque hotel and say, you know something, we're re reintroducing ourselves to the market as a grown-up product. Um, and, you know, even Condé Nast has rated us number five in New York now. So at the end of the day, we're just proud of where we've ended up and hope that, you know, the effort gets the reception it should get. Yeah. So. When I met your, your father, um, he came across like a really great guy. Yeah, thank you. Tenacious, maybe quite bullish as a, as a business person, which I like and admire. Yes. Yeah, and funny. I can see certain traits in you. Uh, great guy. It's funny that know, at, 80, at almost 86, he's, he's a much more bullish business person than I am. It's very funny. He, he's uh, always, um, I guess he wouldn't have had the success he's had in his life if he wasn't a, a very positive um, person and believing that, you know, I can walk into a space, build something, and they will come. You know, that's, that's a courageous way to look That's at bold. things you know it's bold to say yeah. I'm gonna take this empty piece of land I'm gonna take 200 acres in New Jersey I'm gonna build a million and a half square feet of office space and major companies are gonna show up and fill my buildings he did that you know he's done amazing things and and uh, I'm always much more conservative funny enough than my 86 year old father so so it's it's a great energy to be around um, at the same time you know it's um, it's amazing because he's a very knowledgeable guy and I get to learn a lot from him. So I'm a lucky person about that. What I was going to get, get, get on to is, would you say entrepreneurs, business people like you and your fa father are kind of um, kind of born, in, born with that kind of mindset or do you have to learn it and, and develop into that person? Listen, a little bit of both. Um, you have to have good mentorship, I think, in certain instances. But I think there are certain per people that are just born with a natural... Um, ability to put the one the effort in to the belief the self-belief um, that they can get it done and that they will figure things out because no no deal that we've ever done was even very successful ones were done without major bumps you know there's always this moment where you feel like the deal's gonna die and it's gonna die on the vine and it's never gonna get built or there's always an incident or a moment in time where something happens and you know our industry is very specific in that sense um, but I think that Entrepreneurial people generally, it's something in them. I know, I know certain people who like the comfort of a salary and, and like the comfort of working at a big company and I get it. Because on the moments where I'm suffering and I'm not making any money or, or I've had a horrible day and all the documents seem like they're falling apart and my, my the counterparties in a transaction are, are being unreasonable. I, I wish I have a job that pays me X and I can just go home and at the end of my day, I can let it go. I take it all home with me. It's all very personal to me. So my, my nights, are a lot of them are sleepless, um, but at the same time, I also love the idea that, you know, it's that I, when I'm looking at other careers that I know other people having, I happen to feel I'm very lucky that I get to do something that's creative um, and that I get to meet and be around such interesting people. So it's all trade-off, you know? Does money motivate you? Creativity motivates me. Obviously, I want to be able to live a nice lifestyle. Um, but I never, even when things were going better, uh, and things were starting to come around, but even when things were going be my best that they've ever been, I never became a big spender. So um, I like travel, I like good meals, I have a nice home. But I never was a guy who had to go out and buy a bunch of cars and a bunch of vacation homes. It wasn't important to me. I just want to be able to enjoy experiences you know I try to create experiences for other people so for me it's about getting to travel and do other experiences when I have my time off so it's relative you know other people would say you live a very big lifestyle the people that I'm generally around I don't live a big lifestyle in comparison to so it really is such a relative thing when you when you really look at I know you you've been around some very successful people as well in England and here and you have to you have to be realistic and say 
do, do you need those things? You don't need those things. You know, there's things that you, a lot of wants. My father used to always differentiate significantly between wants and need. Mm. You know, as a kid, you always say, I need this to your father. And your father's like, nah, need is not the right word right, right there in that sentence. You don't need an expensive bicycle. You'd like the expensive bicycle. So yeah, yeah. it's all, it's a very relative thing. So I'm very lucky that also in the industry and you as well in the arts, a lot of the things that you get to do are not necessarily tied to your ability to pay for it, but it's tied to who you're friends with and who you have a relationship with and who can make a call on your behalf. So, you know, being in hospitality, I've gotten to live a lifestyle that may even be in excess of what I can personally afford, but because of relationships, people, you know, want reciprocity, want the opportunity to be around you, be, you be around them. So people share. So it's a big part of hospitality is, is that opportunity to experience things and people being a little bit open to helping you out to get to experience those things without necessarily paying full, full rate. So, When you touched on something now, um, it reminded me of a bit of a cliche quote, it's a bit cheesy, which is your net work determines your net worth. How important do you think it is to have like-minded, solid, good people around you to develop your business? I think it's incredibly important because otherwise you're doing everything yourself. Um, you know, listen, I know some people who have very small organizations, but they don't have the time to enjoy what they've created. And then I know people who have huge organizations that, that can't let go, you know, and then they end up overly involved in details they shouldn't be involved in. So there's, a, there's somewhere in between that really makes sense. Uh, you know, it's like where you have enough staff that you actually trust, can actually hand off responsibilities to, and actually feel like they're going to accomplish them. Because, you know, a comment I have made to people before is, is if I have to call you three times to make sure you're doing something, I don't really need you. Because if I have to call you three times, then I might as well have just done it myself. So, you know, it's, it's finding those people that actually can take, you know, I, I'm a very loyal person to my staff when they're loyal to me. And I value loyalty as one of the most important factors because I, the people I consider loyal, in part, are the people that I consider, if I make a phone call to them, they will show up and they will get it done. And it's nice to know you have a certain number of those people around because otherwise I would spend my entire time just double checking stuff. So there's definitely some truth to the statement that you made. Do you, um, do you set goals? Um, no, you know what's interesting? It's the budget, like having a budget process for a hotel is a great thing because it forces you to actually set goals and to say, okay, what is at least my next year? I don't really personally have these goals that I need to have X number of hotels or X amount of dollars. As I said, I just, I enjoy the creative process. I want to do deals that I'm interested in. You know, I've had the opportunity to do a lot of low-end projects that I've turned down that really didn't seem of interest to me. Um, so I, I would just say that my goal is to, to get to continue doing creative work and making a nice living off of it and being able to support my family uh, and to provide, provide for my family and friends. And, and that, that's my biggest goal, I'd say. So bar your energy and the way you are as a business person, the second thing that stood out um, to me about you was your great taste in art. Oh, so at, at the Curtain Hotel, you have some wicked, fabulous art there. Thanks. The number one thing that stood out to me at your art collection at the time, which was down in the Chicago room, I think it was. It was uh, Imperial room. That's it. Yeah. Was your Banksy. Thank and I'm you. obviously a big fan of Banksy, right. uh, obviously being a British artist and obviously just doing some um, quite, quite crazy uh, public stunts and his market's doing really well. But as you well know, I represent uh, the, the Godfather street art who was co coined that by the New York Times. And um, I just wanted to ask, like, how come art has been a bit of a fascination for you? Would you deem yourself as a collector? Um, I guess I'm a collector. Um, you know, my parents um, have a very beautiful collection and that's a big focus in their home. And my parents have always only bought art that they're willing to hang in their house. Uh, they, they don't buy art just to buy art. They'll buy art because they believe in the piece, but it has to be something that they'll enjoy. Um, so I'm a big believer that you generally should only be buying stuff that you have a reason to enjoy. If you, if you can't personally enjoy it, you shouldn't really be buying it. Um, so there's certain artists that I see and I'm like, yeah, I wouldn't buy that artist because I don't get it. I, I wouldn't enjoy that. It doesn't either make me interested, doesn't, make, doesn't evoke a thought, or doesn't make me feel calm. Um, Banksy, I think, is brilliant. I just, you know, I knew I was coming into the, into the shortage market. Uh, I knew that he had done a lot of uh, early work <coughs> in that general neighborhood. And I, I believed in the, not his politics necessarily, because I actually don't agree with some of his politics, but I, 
agree. I believe that he is brilliant at messaging, and that the the thought process behind it is so smart. And so for me, it evokes a lot of thought when I see his artworks. Um, similar, like a Malcolm Gladwell, who just approaches things from a different angle than the way I think. And so I really respect the fact that he, the way he approaches his choices, amazes me. You know. But because I was around art as a kid, and because my parents, um, one of the things that they thought was an important element of growing up, and because my father had the success that he had early in my life, took us on a lot of travel. So we experienced a tremendous amount of travel growing up. I always valued art as something that represented culture and represented experience. So for me, that's one of the reasons why I enjoy it, and I like presenting that experience. So. You know, I think if you look throughout this entire hotel, there is a real story to the way we present our art here. There's a whole old and new kind of thought process, things that tie back to history, the things that tie back to today in the meatpacking district. The art in the guest rooms here, for example, there's an artist that I had worked with in 2002. <clears throat> I went back, got access to all of that art, and then sort of did a comparison between shots from then and shots from today's meatpacking district and the area surrounding it and really made it this contrast. And that's a big part of the, the art experience of what we put into all the different elements of this hotel. So, so yeah, I think art is a, a big element and of what I like to do. And it is a big part of my life. Um, without me realizing it, I guess I am a bit of a collector, um, though it's not my primary focus as a business. So, so some people, I, I, I would agree that a lot of people buy art because it moves them. It's got some cultural uh, significance and it complements their other art that right. they might have in their portfolio. But there is a demographic as well that also buy art to preserve their money and also to make money. Right. You know, people do flip pieces and make money. Is that a factor for you? You know, when you're looking at art, would you say preserving your money and potentially making money? The Richard Hamilton, when we bought the Richard Hamilton, in part it was because of the story that you explained to me. I wasn't that familiar with him. I dug into it after the fact. Um, I said my father was going to be coming over to London. We'd like to talk to you about it. Um, and, you know, I bought the story. And once I bought the story, I felt, you know something? If I buy the story and if the, and if the estate does a good enough job of getting that story out to the general market, there will be a massive increase in value. I think we were right. I think that um, the estate uh, has done an amazing job of getting the story out there. Um, you know, so there are moments in time where you look at a piece and you say, listen, I love the aesthetic, but I also love the story behind it on a financial basis and you buy. Um, that one I would say was a combination. I wouldn't have bought the, I wouldn't have spent the kind of money I spent on the Banksy if I didn't believe that there would be appreciation. At the same time, I also love the piece. So if I had only broken even on it, I would have been okay with it. Like I said, only buy art that you really enjoy because that your worst case is the expenditure is creating your environment. Um, but it's also wonderful to find artists that have reasons for why there will be growth in their value. Um, but you need to look at, think that through and it, and it usually takes a little bit of a deeper look than just um, you know seeing something and being like, oh, I love it. You know, there's usually a little bit more to it, why something will be successful. What's the story behind the artist? Where does he live? Who does he know? Who does he also sell to? Um, you know, what is the political story behind it? You know, what school of artists does he work with? You know, um, there's a million reasons why you would choose a, a, an artist and a piece. Um, you know, and sometimes you just buy it because it, you know, it fits within your budget and you just really like it. You know, so I have some of those as well. Some of those will never go up, but that's a trade. You know, so so Richard, Richard Hamilton. I mean, I mean, even the piece that you got down there, I won't obviously say how much you paid for it, but they are commanding now. You know, north of two hundred twenty-five, two hundred fifty thousand. Great, uh, which is fantastic. And I think we're only just scratching the surface. I believe in the next 12, 18, 24 months, the market's really going to take off because of certain factors. Right. Um, and like you just said, once you listen to the story and look at the narrative, most people fall in love with it, as I did right. back in 2014. The other thing I'm really humbled by is as you come into the hotel, it is bang there above the lifts. Right. Um, why did you choose to put the Richard Hamilton blue standing shadow figure where it is in the hotel? I think he's an iconic artist of New York. Um, I think that that image is, you know, the color scheme is relaxing, but the image is haunting. And I think it's, it's sort of mysterious as you walk in through the front doors and it's, and it's centered off of our front doors. So, you know, we have a beautiful shot of our front entrance and it's literally dead center above the front entry through the glass windows. 
And, um, you know, we just think it sort of evokes, you know, New York, you know, 1985, 1982. You know, I know he traveled around, you know, North America and even some European cities, placing his art all over cities to give that sense of Maccabur, but, but also, um, you know, a sense of sort of interest in place. And, um, you, know, you know, we made a big commitment to art. Uh, this neighborhood is committed to art with the Whitney, uh, with the High Line, having a lot of art pieces up on the High Line. Um, we just thought it really made a statement. And um, so I think people actually really enjoy that that's the first thing that you see when you walk through the doors. Yeah, it's beautiful. Really, it's a Thank very, you. very good example of a Richard Hamilton. Look, I know you're probably demanded in here and I know you've probably got a million things going through your head because you need to get back to work. I get yeah. that. I've got one more question sure. to ask you. Thank you. I've come up with a, a mantra when I first got into business for myself. Um, I believe in boxing and in business, they're, they're two of the same thing, but the mindset, you know, you're either, you're either fighting or you're, you're being kind of attacked in business sometimes. You right. need to know how to roll, roll with the punches. Anyway, the mantra is this, be happy, never content. And I try and stick by that all the time. So if I were to ask you, Michael, what does be happy, never content mean to you? Is that the question you ask everyone at the end of every interview? Yeah. <laughs> Be happy, never content. Um, it's hard because, like you said, I'm not the stop and smell the roses kind of guy. So it's it's just you know I don't know. I think it's something to aspire to. To be honest with you, what you're saying, what you're suggesting, because it's very difficult. You you get lost in the trees, and sometimes you really don't see the forest. And I definitely know I get lost in the trees. So it's it's actually a good thought for me to leave here with. I appreciate you bringing it up because I need to spend more time trying to be happy and less about being satisfied because there's so many things to be happy about. So I, I don't know. I don't have an answer to that other than to say I should be more focused on that issue as well. So I appreciate you bringing it up. Thank okay? you, Michael. Thanks, buddy. Thank you. Thank you.